on right now. So that is rolling. And um, I'll um, just welcome everyone. It's great to see, see you all. And uh, this is another um, session in the series for the American Center for the Study of Distance Education. Um, I think, uh, Michael, you probably know a little bit of the history of the, the center. Um, I think everybody else here probably does as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we've, uh, we're sort of uh, relaunching the center this year. And uh, this is, um, Michael has been uh, kind enough to join us for another uh, presentation in the, in the ongoing series, the Never Ending Symposium, uh, Online Symposium. And um, it's, it's really good to see everybody. Um, so uh, I posted uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Barber's uh, bio up on the website. And I think what I'll do, I, uh, for, for uh, your information, uh, you know, we just kind of keep these, uh, these presentations fairly formal, I mean, informal. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Michael in a second, but, um, and Michael, you can, you know, you, if you want to have a chat, a discussion along the way, that's fine, or however you'd like, like things to go, that's, that's perfectly fine. We, we do keep things rather informal. Um, if I, I had some internet issues earlier, so if I drop out, I'll be back in. Um, and uh, I think at this point, um, I will just um, mention that, uh, let me share my screen for just a second. I wanted to mention one thing before we get going here. Um, so Michael uh, has uh, contributed a chapter to, to the Handbook of Distance Education, fourth edition uh, on the state of uh, K-12 in distance ed. And I also wanted to just also note, I'm going to share my screen here one second. And, um, so hopefully you can see my screen there. I wanted to also just mention that uh, there's a, a good book online blended and distance education in schools. Uh, I think uh, as Michael's going over his, uh, his topic, he'll probably mention Tom Clark and uh, He's uh, contributed chapters on K-12 in the handbook as well. And, um, but I wanted to make you aware of this, this book that, uh, that Michael has co-authored. And I think with that, I will stop my share and I'll just turn it over to you. All right, sounds Thanks. good. Um, let me start sharing my screen here now. So I'm gonna only share part of it here so I can, it should be big enough for the PowerPoint, but also then small enough that I can continue to see the um, chat window and the, um, the faces as well. So that way, uh, let me pull up the chat. There we go. Over the side. Perfect. Yeah. And I'll keep my eye on the chat window as well for you as you're okay. Moving through no and, um, and as Will said, I think I'm probably, in terms of my presentation style, as informal as uh, the uh, setting requires. So uh, feel free to, you know, if you've got questions as I'm going along, feel free to let me know. Um, either, you know, grab the, the mic or toss them into the chat window. I've got it there on the main page now, so I can sort of keep an eye on it as I'm going along. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the the book there, Will. It's because uh, that was actually one that uh, Dr. Moore. Um, it was a series that he was working his way through. Uh, so I believe the first one was more of a, a general one that focused upon uh, distance education, adult settings. We were the second one that he uh, had uh, solicited, the one that Tom and I did, um, that focused on the K-12 realm. I think there's been one on workplace. I know there's been another one specifically on social presence theory that I know Amy, uh, Amy uh, Garrett Dickers was involved with um, and Karen Swain I think was the other person involved with that one. And I think there's probably six or seven of them in the series now that he's been doing. So um, ours is the K-12 one in, in that series and 
I, I think the idea was that he uh, was trying to take a series of sort of either um, constituencies, if you will, or topics that were appearing in the uh, annual handbook, not I shouldn't say annual, the semi-annual handbook that was coming out every three or four years and um, taking, you know, creating them into these edited books so we could explore those topics in much greater detail. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about just the, an overview of the, the landscape of K-12 online learning, exploring what is known. And the, top, the, the title actually comes from the uh, title in, of my chapter in the Handbook of Distance Education. So I'm going to try to follow the rough format that I've got in there, although I will likely, um, uh, I guess, try to provide a little bit more of an updated version of the stuff we've got in there. Because while this was published officially um, within the last 12 months, if I'm not mistaken, Will, He's on mute. For yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Just came out in uh, January. Yeah, but, um, you know, as everyone here in the audience knows, when it comes to these kind of book projects, while it was published in January, the last bit of edits were probably done back in, in August or June sometime, which means the bulk of the chapter and most of the content was probably written a year before that once it went through all the various editing things. So, um, you know, as everyone here knows, so while it has a January 2019 publication date, it's probably good up till sometime in late 16 or early 17 in terms of the currency of the information that's in there. Um, so one of the first things that you have to sort of figure out as you're looking at, at the field, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the term field kind of loosely, um, but the field of, of K-12 online learning is, is when you're looking at a, a landscape that looks something like this, which is a, a graphic that I pulled from the um, second last of the keeping pace with K-12 online and blended learning or K-12 online learning um, reports that John Watson and his team at Evergreen Education Group did. And if you're not familiar with, with this project, it's one that you really want to um, take a look at. Uh, the website itself is just kpk12.com. So I'll toss that up in the, um, the chat window here now. And essentially what John did over the span of, I think this was probably the 14th or 15th one that he did, um, and they've rebooted it now this year, was they would essentially look on a state-by-state -state basis starting back in like 05 or 06, and they would um, essentially state-by-state -state go through and look at what kind and the amount of or sorry, what kind of regulation was in that state when it came to online and blended learning, and then what kind of activity was happening. In some cases, this was a, a very detailed account, and here's the exact number of students and the exact number of programs. Um, and in other cases, it was a little bit more nebulous depending upon the state. But it was all sort of within a realm of trying to describe this mess of stuff you see here on the screen. And um, the following year, uh, so in the 2016 report, while the graphic looks a little bit cleaner, it's still a lot of stuff that's happening when you're looking at, you know, what's happening in the K-12 online learning environment and how do you go about describing what that is and, and talking about it as a single field. And for that matter, even if you look at the differences in the title down here, um, by 2016, he was back calling it, you know, keeping pace with K-12 online learning. But if you go to uh, the website and actually go to the Keeping Pace reports, you'll see that depending on the year, you've got like K-12 digital learning here. Uh, a lot of these just say K-12 online learning. And then in 2012, it starts to be online and blended, online and blended. Um, you know, and then we move into the digital realm and then it's back to just online learning again. So, you know, trying to come up with that idea of, you know, what is the field and how do we describe it has always been a, a, a big issue. And, and then the individual components within the field, because simply to say K-12 online learning really doesn't tell you a great deal when you're looking at these kinds of variables and how do we describe what that might look like. So um, one of the first people that tried to really do it, and, and Will Men said I'd mention his name a couple of times, and I'm sure I will many times throughout this. Um, Tom Clark in 2000 wrote a uh, report 
uh, called the, the State of the States, in which he tried to describe the different types of, of online, or at the time, he was describing as distance learning environments at the K-12 realm. And he focused mainly upon the who was providing the program in terms of the, the nature of the provider and then the to a lesser extent the geographic focus so you had some of these things like you know there were these cyber charter schools were one and private online or private virtual schools were another and then statewide virtual schools or statewide sea virtual schools uh, state education agency virtual schools uh, were another and and with in a couple of years, really very quickly, that got to be quite muddled because you'd get these programs, and I use a couple of examples in the, the chapter, where you could describe the program falling under two or three of Tom's categories, and, and that really wasn't helpful. Um, in 2012, John Watson and his team, again with the, the Evergreen um, and the Keeping Pace reports, came out with these dimensions, and for the most part, these are the ways in which we've tried to describe K-12 online learning programs ever since. Um, so you've got you know, those eight or 10 uh, dimensions down the sides, and then you've got the various variables going across uh, in the middle that look at, I guess, the different options that you've got. So you could take a program like a um, Odyssey Charter School, which is a, uh, a hybrid style program, really, that's based in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. And you could say that, you know, it's a full time program, that it has, for the most part, a, a district based reach. Its type is set up as a charter school. Um, students will go both to the physical school for a half day a week. And then the other four and a half days a week, or I guess for the rest of the week, I should say, because it's not like they can't be doing this on the weekend as well, they'll take their classes from home. The uh, instruction that's delivered to them in their online courses that they would take from home or really wherever they wanted to be are asynchronous in nature, whereas the one that they do in the school in that half day that they're at the school is synchronous. And you can sort of go down, and I won't do this for – all of them, but you can go down the different dimensions and use that as a way of describing the program. Um, and that has become very useful for us because what we can then focus upon is then how do you define what is online learning? And that becomes a lot easier than trying to figure out the types of programs. Um, so within the field, typically speaking, what you will find is that um, online learning is just a, or K-12 online learning is oftentimes just a general term or general phrase that we use to describe the overall field. Um, so whenever you see this written in the literature, really it doesn't give you a good sense as to what type of program that they're talking about, but they are basically talking about a program where at least for certain portions of the student's education, that the teacher and the student are separated by time or by geography, and that separation is mediated through some kind of online tools. Um, typically speaking within the literature, you've, you've tended to see a distinction developed between virtual school and cyber school, uh, with virtual school tending to be used for those that we would describe as supplemental in nature. So this is where you have a student that's enrolled in a brick and mortar school or a physical face-to-face -face school, but they might take one or more of their classes online because they can't get it in the school for one reason or another. There's a scheduling conflict. There's not enough student demand. Um, it's, uh, they just don't want to take gym first period in the morning and then have to get in the shower with everyone else so that they don't stink for the rest of the day. I mean, the, the number of reasons that you'd have for this is, is endless, to be honest with you. Um, whereas a cyber school, within the literature, at least I should say within the academic literature, for the most part refers to a full-time form of K-12 online learning. So these are the kids that will never, at least for the, the year that they're in the school will never step foot into a brick and mortar school. They will do 100% of their schooling on the computer or using some sort of offline activities that have been provided by the online teacher. Um, and I'll show you a couple of models of those too as we get a little bit later. Now you'll notice in John's 
um, the covers of his reports and the titles, you know, we also had this K-12 online and blended learning. And oftentimes we see online and blended, at least within the K-12 realm, included together to the point that what's started to happen is you've seen a focus on the term digital learning, which is what people have started to use to describe both online and blended. Um, and I'll start off by saying that this is a problem in the U.S. and in the U.S. alone um, because, um, well, if I could put, you know, my little soapbox hat on for a minute because in all honesty, you know, Americans like to commercialize things for the most part. And um, it has typically been the commercial interests and those organizations that have been advocating that commercial vendor based interest that have driven the field a lot. Um, so because of that, you've seen this online and blended learning get commingled a fair amount. Um, in terms of an actual definition for blended learning, at least within the academic literature that focuses on the K-12 environment, we really don't have a good definition for it. Um, within the higher ed environment, uh, Charles Graham has probably put together, I think, what is uh, the, I think the best general definition for the, the topic. And um, he basically describes it as the inclusion of face-to-face -face instruction along with the use of online tools, which may or may not involve the um, separation in terms of time, distance, and, and pace um, with the instructor. Uh, so basically, just as it sounds, blending face-to-face -face with, with online instruction. So that'll give you, I guess, a sense as to... Um, how we describe these or how we try to define these within the field. So when you're looking in the literature and I'll get into that a little, the literature a little bit more, in actually about four slides. Um, when you see virtual school and cyber school, in most cases, they are referring to those specific type of things, although not exclusively. So when we're looking at the virtual schooling, at least from the U S perspective, um, you know, they're, in terms of the amount of activity that's happening, you know, when we look at a state by state basis, um, you know, these are the states right now that have the statewide supplemental programs. Um, and most of these that you see listed here are ones that the statewide supplemental program was likely developed sometime in the late 90s to early 2000s with maybe a couple of exceptions there. And that's largely due to the fact that at the time there was either a lot of federal or state funding available to set up these kinds of programs. Um, so in many cases, either SEAs or these arm length agencies from the, that were, I guess, authorized by the SEA uh, in an individual state decided to create these types of programs. Um, and some of these have been going around for, for quite some time. Um, you know, Florida, which is generally considered sort of one of the oldest in the country, uh, the Florida Virtual School was established back in 96, 97. Um, so that was its, its first year. So, you know, we're looking at its second decade of operation. Um, the field itself, if you're looking at just online forms of K-12 distance education, the field is usually pegged at beginning in terms of practice. In the early 90s, there was a private school, Laurel Springs School here in California, that um, started offering some online courses. Um, in uh, Utah, used to have the Utah Electronic School, which started around 94, 95, um, or actually 94, 95 is when it started to transition from a correspondence-based school to starting to offer online offerings. Um, so at this stage, we're really only a couple of years away from being um, what is really almost three decades old in terms of, you know, the amount of, of time that many of these programs have been in operation. Um, even some of the later admits, so if you look at Michigan as an example, or Illinois, those programs started around 2000, 2001. And so they are coming up on that 20th anniversary. Actually, now they say that I think Michigan was 99 because I vaguely remember seeing something about its 20th anniversary um, in the past year. So when you're looking at the numbers of students that are involved here, um, this gives you a sense as to the enrollments in those statewide supplemental programs. And it's important to point out that these are course enrollments, not the number of students enrolled. So if you have a student that takes, say, 
three classes from their brick and mortar school and enrolls in two courses from the um, Idaho Digital Learning Academy, that actually accounts for two enrollments of the 27,280 that they've got there. So that's not necessarily unique students. That's just the total number of enrollments that are there. Um, you know, so the total number of enrollments in the most recent data that we've got, which is about two school years old now, considering that we're about to finish 1819. Actually, I guess in a month's time, it'll be about three school years old. Um, says that there were about a million enrollments and you can see that number has been at least from the previous year fairly consistent. One of the things that we've started to see within the field in terms of the practice um, that would probably skew those numbers significantly is the number of district based programs. Um, you know, so as an example in Michigan, um, the Michigan Virtual School is reporting about 25,000 enrollments in 16-17 but yet every single student in the state of Michigan uh, has to have an online course in order to graduate from high school. So what that has created is a lot of district-based programs that will um, in some cases contract with Michigan Virtual or other vendor-based, um, other vendors that will provide for the opportunity to essentially create their own programs. And we don't have good numbers for those because really there are so many of them out there and in many cases, we don't even know that they exist. Um, I was involved as an expert witness in a court case a couple of years ago uh, with a district in Missouri where the district had a supplemental online program, so essentially a district-based version of these ones we've been talking about here. They also had a full-time program that the students were required to actually come to the school in order to engage in. And then they had a third program that was also full-time that the students could do from home. Now on paper, within the district's student information system, all students in all three of these programs were all registered in one of the high schools in the district. So when you're looking actually at the data from that high school, it was impossible to know if the student that you were looking at was a student that was in the face-to-face -face school or if they were in the face-to-face -face school and taking one or two classes online or if they were in an online program that just happened to meet in the school or if they were in a full-time online program that just happened to never come to school at all. They were all registered in the one school in the same you know, SIS system. So they could have had 200 students involved. They could have had 20,000 students involved. We really have no idea. Um, how many were involved, but if you look at Missouri, um, just on this, the number of students involved, or at least the number of enrollments in the statewide supplemental program were less than 2,000, um, 1,872. But yet this was an urban school district that, you know, probably had 10 or 12,000 or more students in it, and we really have no idea how many of those students were engaged in online learning, either supplemental or full-time. So those district-based programs really do throw a wrench into our ability to understand how many students are there. Even just looking at the difference between enrollments and students. Um, the average student will take uh, one course, but you have some that are taking as many as four or five courses um, and still just doing one or two in their face-to-face -face classroom. So if you, you know, use an example like Florida where there were just under half a million enrollments, we really don't know how many students that is. Um, a good rule of thumb, and this is just a complete you know, estimate, but it's sort of what we often do in the field, is usually about two thirds to 70% is the, the actual number of students involved. So if you look at a, a jurisdiction like Florida where there's almost a half a million enrollments, you could reasonably say that there's probably about 320 to 350,000 unique students that are enrolled in one or more courses through the Florida Virtual School last year. But again, that's just a, a ballpark sort of rule of thumb that we've decided to use in the field based upon the data that we've seen for jurisdictions that will actually report number of students. And some will do that. Um, if we're looking at the full-time programs, as you can see here, 
the full-time programs, there's a lot more states that are involved than what there were in the supplemental programs. And if you're sort of comparing the two maps in your mind, and I'll jump back to the other one in a second, you'll see that a lot of jurisdictions only have one or the other. So because there's fewer of them here, take a look at the white ones on this map here, and then compare that with the green ones on this map here what you'll find is many of the states that don't have full-time programs still have those supplemental programs that are available to students. And it's only actually about half of the states that have both options. So we've got half that have both, um, and then of the 50% that have one or the other, more of them will have full-time programs than part-time programs. Now, You'll see over here on the right-hand side, you'll get a sense as to the enrollment by state of full-time students in that jurisdiction. So as an example, and, and these are coming from um, a couple of school years ago, uh, so similar to the data that we looked at before. Um, actually, as you can see here, it's the 17, 18 years, so we're almost finished 18, 19, so about one, actually, only, I guess not couple, basically one year behind. You know, there are just over 35,000 students in Pennsylvania that never stepped foot into a brick and mortar school that did all of their schooling online. Um, in the case of Michigan, it was about 20, a little over 25,000. In the case of California, exactly 25,000. Um, and think about the differences in population between Michigan and California and knowing that they have roughly the same number of um, full-time students and so on and so forth working their way down. And then you'll see over here on the very far right, you get the percentage of K-12 students in that state. So as you can see, even the states that have the greatest proportion of students that are involved in full-time uh, virtual schooling or full-time cyber schooling, I should say, um, often referred to as cyber charter schooling or virtual charter schooling in many states, it's really only at best 2% of the total population of students. Uh, Pennsylvania, it's just over two. You can see here Colorado, it's just under two. And then there's several others there that are in that 1.7, 1.8 kind of range. Um, Oklahoma there is just over 1.6. Um, so really we're not talking about a, a great number of students. Um, the big difference here is that in this case, because they're doing all of their schooling, online, when you're looking at the number of credits they're generating, depending on the state they're in, um, you know, they're generating four to six, in some cases, as many as eight credits per semester. Um, so in the case of Pennsylvania, you know, that 35,000, multiply that by 12, and you would get a figure that would be comparable to the numbers you would be seeing over here in terms of course enrollments. Because, you know, if I'm a student sitting in Pennsylvania, I might be enrolled in six courses right now this semester. That means I'm enrolled in 12 over the two semesters, which would mean um, I used to be a social studies teacher. So if there's any math folks in the room, help me out here. But 35,000 times 12, um, that's at 350, another 420,000. So that would put Pennsylvania basically close to where you see Florida on this number in terms of total enrollments. Um, you know, so it'll give you sort of a sense as the scale if you want to make some, start making some comparisons in between. Um, I think the important thing to point out here is to notice how many of the states where it's point something, you know, the proportion of full-time online students or the proportion of cyber school students is zero point something you know so you're looking at one out of every hundred students or less for many of these so um, it's interesting that you've got this kind of of um, concentration of of folks that are you know in terms of the research that's going on when really we're talking about so few students in many cases and even in the the media you often hear um, particularly about programs like, well, the Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow, uh, which was in Ohio that went under uh, a couple of years ago because of financial mismanagement and essentially, um, well, depending on how you view the city, them scamming the state um, is, is how I would describe it in terms of, of funding and enrollments. But when you look at Ohio on this list, let's see, it's up here, we're talking about 1.1% 1 .1 
of the students. But yet how much airplay did, you know, the electronic classroom of tomorrow, those virtual charter schools get in the state of Ohio uh, for quite some time. Indiana has had a lot of uh, upheaval about their regulations recently. And um, really there's almost on average about one news article a week about virtual charter schools in Indiana, even right now. And we're talking about 1.22% of the students in the state that are involved in it. Um, so oftentimes, because I think that there is that commercialization and that for-profit aspect in the field, uh, the amount of attention that's paid to this is often outsized compared to uh, the number of students involved in it. So um, when we're looking about, uh, you know, at the research in particular, what can we say about the research that's going on in this field? Well, the first thing that we can say about it, just noticed I've my slides are a little bit out of order, is um, for the most part, the research that we've seen during the first decade to really even up to the 15, 18 year mark, for the most part has really fallen into um, a couple of categories. The first is that you've had a lot of research that has focused upon um, or at least I shouldn't say research, a lot of literature that's focused upon the personal experiences of some individual that's been involved in virtual schooling. Um, so you've seen a lot of um, not necessarily peer-reviewed research, but a lot of things that would be published in, say, journals like um, EdTech or um, historically tech trends before it started to become a little bit more rigorous uh, when Dan Surrey became the editor. Um, or the ASCD uh, um, journals, or Leading and Learning with Technology, those kinds of publications. In many cases, the authors of those pieces, you know, were, I'm a virtual school administrator, and let's, let me tell you about some of the great things we've done with our virtual school. Or, you know, I'm a teacher that's, you know, uh, that's, you know, doing something related to online learning in my class. Let me tell you, you know, some of the things that we found great about it and some of the challenges we had. And even some of the research, like when I go and look through dissertations, even still now, focused upon the field of K-12 online learning, in many cases, it's, you know, I'm a teacher or an administrator at this particular school, and I'm going back to research my school based upon something that I see happening in my class or in my school that I'm interested in. And, and even the research that comes about from those, um, oftentimes I would say is, is, to put it nicely, I think disappointing is probably the best way of, of putting it. Because I know dissertation research for, for many folks is, is the most comprehensive piece of work that they will ever do because they have the most time to put into it. And, and because oftentimes it's their first piece, they're the most particular about it, um, you know, because they, they don't want to get it wrong. And, and um, a lot of what I see being produced in, in, in doctoral studies um, when it comes to this topic, oftentimes I think misses the mark because people are overly invested in the particular context that they happen to be in. Um, and then we also have, in all honesty, the, the, while the, the quote is 13 years old at this point, it, it's still an accurate quote. You know, given the level of participation, even if we're only talking two or three percent of the, the students, when you combine both the uh, supplemental and the full-time online learning uh, throughout the U.S., really we're still, you know, the amount of research that's available out there is quite small. And to, to give you a sense as to how small it was, um, I worked together with a group of students from Brigham Young University this past year, um, where uh, as part of one of their uh, graduate level courses, they're supposed to explore a topic related to the research in educational technology and then write a manuscript on it, which I think is a wonderful little project. And they work in groups. So I was working with three of their students and our project was to actually go through and we try to identify every single journal article, not peer reviewed, but just journal article that was out there specific to K-12 online learning, so we excluded the blended stuff because there wasn't a good definition for it, and then to do some analysis of what we found in that particular field. And 
Um, it was interesting because the first article we could find written about it was in 94, which, you know, we're looking at what, 25 years ago now. But in those 25 years, we were only able to find 356 articles, you know, which isn't that much when you think about it in terms of the life of a field. Over 25 years, that averages out to about 12 and a half articles a year, which isn't, you know, a, a great deal of, of research into a particular area when you consider that there are five states in the United States right now that require students to have an online course on their transcript in order to graduate from high school. It is actually a requirement. They can, you know, they could have a 100% 4.0 GPA. And if they don't have at least one course that was delivered online on their transcript, they will not graduate from high school. You know, so we've got five states that have made this a requirement, but yet we've had so little research. And as you can see, obviously, the number of articles have increased over time as we've gone by, although there's been a couple of dips that have happened along the way. But for the most part, you know, the line of best fit gives you a nice upward trend. And it's, it's not only trending upward, but it's one of those sort of exponential slopes that ideally would get, you know, a much uh, higher, um, you know, realm. And when we look at the, the nature of the field, it's actually quite fascinating in terms of where things are, are being published. Um, so, as you can see here, these are the top 10 journals in terms of the number of articles. And um, uh, the first thing I'll say is I love the fact that, you know, the American Journal of Distance Education is at the top because, you know, that's a journal that's been associated with the, the center here for a long time. And, and you know, one that obviously Michael, uh, Dr. Moore was responsible for uh, founding and, and still edits to this day. And, um, you know, with the exception of the Journal of Online Learning, which was created in 2015 specifically to publish research on K-12 online distance and blended learning. Um, so that's all they publish is, is online and, uh, dis and blended stuff. Um, and they're up to 25 now. Basically, AJDE is the next uh, journal there. So you can see that, um, you know, it's had quite a coverage. And what you find here, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions like Tech Trends or uh, the Morning Watch, which is actually a, um, a university-based journal out of Memorial University of Newfoundland, which has a long history um, with distance education and as well, particularly K-12 distance education, and had three or four researchers that were involved in the field. Um, so basically, you've got all of your main distance education journals, um, you know, Quarterly Review, IRODL, um, you know, J. Tate is there, the New Zealand Journal is there, um, the Canadian Journal is there, and the American Journal is at the, you know, the top of the list when you exclude JOLR. The thing that we found quite interesting was that um, there were 102 journals that we discovered uh, of the total number of journals we found that published a single article about online learning. That was it. And... Um, you know, that seemed a little bit odd uh, when we first looked at it until we started to get into, you know, essentially who was publishing in general. So of those 350 odd articles that we had, there were 384 distinct authors. And one of the things we did was rank them by number of authors. And you can see the top 11 that we've got there in terms of, and also the number of articles that each has published. And in all honesty, as I look at that list, um, the first thing that I'll say is it's largely due to uh, amount of time spent in the field. So you have a bunch of people at the top that, you know, were early entrants into the field, but many of them have stopped publishing um, right now. And then you have a bunch of folks near the bottom that are later entrants into the field and are just, you know, if we were to have done, you know, included all the data from say 2018, their numbers would have climbed. And then there's me who got in about the time everyone was starting and is still publishing in the area. So I'll be honest with you and say my number there is not a reflection of um, so much of my output as it is so much of the fact that I've only had a singular focus in um, my research career. Um, so, and it happened to just be a focus that uh, happened around the same time all of these early entrants were starting as well. The thing that, uh, and this ties into the journal aspect, if you look at this third point here, I think it's a key thing. Um, of the 384 authors that we had, 276 of them, so 
probably I'm just doing the math in my head here. Oh, sorry, the math is right there for me. Just under 75% of them published a single article. And that was it. Um, so what I'm guessing is a lot of these 276 people were likely responsible for the 102 journals that we had where there was a single article. So you might have had somebody say in the field of um, special education that got a, you know got their doctorate in special education and decided to turn their dissertation into a journal article and submitted it to some special education journal. And that's the only thing that that special education journal has ever published on the field. And special education is actually a bit of a bad example only because um, there's actually a, or there was a federally, well, the center is still there. Um, there's a center for online learning and students with disabilities at the University of Kansas that uh, had five years worth of federal funding to look at issues around online learning and special education in the K-12 realm. So um, that's one of the areas where actually there's a fair amount of research that's been done. Um, but it's, it's a good illustrative one um, that you've got there. So um, the other thing that, you know, we look at as we look at some of these numbers is we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this just part of a field that's growing up? And, you know, when Kathy, Tom, and I wrote uh, this piece a decade ago, we thought that, you know, this kind of thing that you're seeing here is probably fairly standard for a field that's just, you know, starting and, and beginning to mature. And at the time we were writing this, if you use that 1994 date as when the first article was written, you know, we're looking at 15 years in. Um, that's probably fairly accurate. You know, 10 years later, now that we're 25 years in, in terms of the, the literature base for the field, I'm not sure how accurate this is in terms of, you know, that it's, it's the natural development. At some point, we sort of need to, you know, take that next step. And uh, one of the things that we don't see happening in the field is taking that next step. So looking at what the research actually says, and I won't get into this too much because um, the chapter does a reasonable job at doing it, but I'll touch on a couple of issues. Um, the vast majority, even still to this day, of the research that's out there is looking at student performance, and it's comparing student performance uh, from what we see in face-to-face -face environments to online environments. And I say still to this day because I was involved in a report that was only released on Tuesday, where one of the three sections of the report does exactly this. Uh, it looks at the effectiveness of virtual schooling. So it still is very much of a, an issue. And all of the other issues that we've got when you look at that research base, um, sort of take a, a side seat, you know. So all of the issues of what constitutes good teaching and learning in an online environment. You know, how do we design, deliver, and support online learning so that different populations of students can have success, or to put it the way my colleague Rick Fig does, under what conditions can online learning work for different constituencies of students? You know, those types of, of questions really haven't had a lot of, uh, of research in the literature and, and uh, or haven't, you know, we haven't seen a lot of research being published on them. And when it has been, it, has, it tends to be methodologically limited. Um, so since they, um, it is the big group that we're looking at. Uh, it does beg the question, you know, if, if comparing student performance is, is where most of the research is, what does it say? Well, um, it's interesting because when we look at the supplemental data, typically speaking, and this is some of the, the earlier stuff that we've got there, and in all honesty, for the most part, people started comparing supplemental performance very early on and that's kind of died out and you only see one or two of those studies being published each year now, whereas the comparison of full-time performance started much later, usually around 2006, 2007, but it's still continuing fairly regularly even to this day. Um, so just to give you sort of a, a time frame and when this kind of hits in terms of the bulk of the literature. But for the most part, what you find is that supplemental students on average do as well or a little better than their face-to-face -face counterparts, you know. And the first thing you ask yourself if you're looking at that kind of research is, okay, well, are we comparing like groups of students? And when you start to look at some of the research that's out there, really we're not. Um, 
you know, there are methodological problems that are involved here. So just, you know, these are four examples from the six that I had on the first page, but instances where you find that the virtual school sample is only looking at, you know, a small proportion of the students where the face-to-face -face sample is looking at a much larger proportion of students. Um, you know, I like this, um, this Kavanaugh one, it was based upon a, um, non-mandatory assessment. So, you know, they assumed or they made the assumption that the type of student that would take a non-mandatory assessment, so essentially you don't have to take this test, but we'd like you to take it. What type of student actually does that? Um, they described as more academically motivated, naturally more higher achieving, which I think is probably good. Uh, but I always think this the, the the diplomatic way in which they worded that I think is always quite nice. Um, even when we look at the type of students that tended to be involved in those supplemental uh, environments at the time, and I say at the time very particularly because that's changed dramatically, but um, this one here that Bill Muirhead and Margaret Holly wrote, I think is probably one of the best quotes that I, I, I've ever seen in terms of describing a student highly motivated self-directed self-disciplined independent learner who can read and write well and had a strong interest in or ability with technology which just sounds like your average high schooler you know but this is the type of student that's enrolled in you know those online supplemental courses and the thing that i always used to ask and, and i still ask them to this day to be honest with you if you have that kind of student that's enrolled in your supplemental online learning and that kind of student is only doing as well or a little bit better than the full range of students that's involved in your face-to-face -face instruction exactly what kind of online learning are you providing that you're dumbing that kind of kid down to the average um, you know, so I think one of the things that we've seen is that, you know, we're really, it has more to do with who's in the online environment than it does the online environment that's being provided. Now, when you're looking at the full-time students, as I said, the research goes back to about 06. And with the exception of that research that has been produced by the companies themselves, um, there has been a consistent theme. And... Um, in the report that was released on Tuesday, I actually have a table. It's an updated version of the one that's in the handbook where it goes back from 06 and looks at every single study and then what was found on them. And basically, if you've been paying attention to, particularly Twitter has done a really good job at amplifying this over the past uh, two days. But So this is the, the web page for the report. And as best I can tell right now, that has had at least um, 27 mentions on Twitter as of the beginning of this session. Um, from that, there was an article that was written by Ed Surge, and I, I point these out because you can see the, the titles here. Despite serious problems and a lack of research support, virtual schools continue to spread as policymakers remain AWOL. Research reveals overwhelming evidence of poor performance by full-time virtual and blended schools. Despite poor performance, virtual school enrollment continues to grow. Um, you know, and this is the kind of thing that, that we, we tend to see in these kinds of environments. And um, there was another one, actually, I realized I didn't end up copying and pasting the, um, but the Washington Post in Valerie Strauss's section, that answer sheet has a nice little piece written up today uh, on the topic as well and, and has a similar headline for us. So, uh, one of the things that you will often find that, that the companies will complain about when they look at this is they'll say that like the supplemental programs that the students aren't comparable and that, you know, they're getting students that have failed in the classroom and that's why they're um, showing up in their virtual schools. And one of the things that the, the NEPC's research or the National Education Policy's research has found consistently and the first finding or the first time they found this was back in 2012. And if you look at it every year since, the findings have been relatively consistent. But for the most part, full-time online students tend to be uh, more white and less minority. They tend to have a lower percentage of free and reduced lunch students. They tend to have a lower percentage of students that have an IEP or have an identified disability. They also tend to have a much lower percentage of um, ELL learners. So when you look at all of those categories that we normally 
um, look at as potential triggers or markers for a student being at risk. For the most part, these full-time programs are dealing with uh, lower percentages of these students than the statewide or national average for that particular group of students. Um, so, you know, not only are these, these programs providing, you know, really poor outcomes, but they're doing it with a better or, you know, at least a statistically, a group of students that statistically speaking should be performing better than their counterparts when we look at those markers of, of at-risk students. Um, the other thing we'll often hear from the corporations and you know, K-12 Inc. is the big one within the field. Uh, Connections Academy, which is a uh, division of Pearson Education, is the other one. But they'll say that these particular programs rely upon the state standardized measure, whatever the state uses to determine if a school is passing or failing. It used to be AYP when Jeff made this quote, but... Um, you know, it's been changed since in many states. And they say that when you look at academic growth that these programs do quite well. And it's interesting because Colorado was actually one of the first jurisdictions that started looking at academic growth as a part of its state accountability measure. And each dot on this graph here represents a school. And the bigger the dot, the bigger the school, basically. And you can see the four uh, quadrants there. So everything above the halfway point is the achievement line. So everything above the halfway mark are higher achieving schools, everything below are lower achieving schools. And then if you're going left to right, things that are on your, um, as you're looking at it on your right hand side, those are the ones that have um, high growth. The ones on the left have low growth. So the quadrant you really wanna be in is the top right hand quadrant. Look at where all the blue dots are, or almost all the blue dots. You know, We've got a couple here that are close or on the line for either achievement or growth. Um, but for the most part, they're all in this low growth, low, th low achievement area. In fact, if you look at it, there's not a single one that's in the high growth area. Um, you know, they're all below the 50th percentile on the growth. We're at the 50th percentile. Now, this is the reading score, or sorry, the math score. This here is the reading score. So you can see they do slightly better in reading. There's a lot more that are above the midway point. So there's a lot more that are achieving higher, but you can still see there's not many over here on the left-hand side in terms of growth. A couple right in the middle, so they're right on that high growth, low growth, you know, 50th percentile kind of range, but no one that's really showing high growth in this. And then when you look at the, um, oh, sorry, I had math in there twice by the looks of it. Apologize about that. Um, as I was copying and pasting in, as I mentioned, uh, Will, I put my slides together, finished them about five minutes before we started today. So I must have forgot to copy and paste the writing one in. Um, so, you know, even when you look at the growth aspect of it, it, it becomes uh, difficult. Yes, well, this particular one is actually just Colorado, James. Um, so these three um, graphs that I've looked at here, these two graphs, because two of them were the same, um, were just Colorado. And I'll fix the, the chart in the font when I send off the wheel that goes on. So the writing one will get in there. Um, all of the other data that I provided is mostly for the U.S., although there are a couple of Canadian references thrown in there, um, mainly in the supplemental area. Um, you know, so as we're looking at, I guess, the, the field as a whole, when you're trying to describe um, what's going on, and this gets down to that idea where I was mentioning earlier when we're looking at that research into um, the teaching and learning aspect, because this is a typical supplemental setup here. Right, so you can see these dotted lines. Each of these dotted lines represents a school. So in this case, there's three schools here. And you can see the students. You can see you know, a teacher, an administrator. There's a, uh, in the case of the course, there's a course designer there. This white area here is the online class. Right, so I've got a teacher that he is here in school A that's teaching a class to some students in his school or her school a couple of students here in school B, a couple of students in school C. And, you know, in each of those schools, they have local IT support. They have, you know, local principal or administrator. You know, in theory, they've got parents or guardians that are involved in this context. Um, many of the schools that are receiving an online course will have a position we call a facilitator or mentor. Um, that's, you know, has, performs that in loco parenthesis role 
for the student, but doesn't actually isn't involved in the actual teaching of the content. Um, you know, and there's a lot of stuff, as you can see, happening here, a lot of potential interactions, both inside of the online class, but also things that are happening locally within the school. And this is really where we start to find the black hole of research for the field, because while there are some isolated studies that look at what's happening here for a single class, or maybe a couple of classes in a program or at a single school or a district, we don't have any really good large scale studies that talks about, you know, what's going on in all of these interactions and, and what's the difference between an effective relationship between the facilitator and the students at their own school or between the facilitator and the online teacher at another school. Um, you know, what role do the parents play for online classes that might be different than face to face classes. Um, you know, do for as an example, I would imagine the vast majority of parents have the opportunity to go to a parent teacher conference at their school. Do they get to talk to the online teacher who might not be based in that school during these types of times. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, that we're looking at and and when we're looking at the full time environment. It becomes even more important. Um, because, you know, here's just another model where you see, you know, there's the online teacher and you've got the mentor teachers and you've got the students in these schools. But what happens in the full time environment where this student moves out into this home and loses this mentor teacher, you know, so essentially each of these blue uh, icons that you see here move out into the individual homes along the side. And when they're in those homes, in some cases, there's a parent or guardian that's around while the student is learning online, but in other cases, there's not. You know, so what does that mean in terms of the types of interactions that are happening when you change that kind of dynamic? Um, you know, within the field, we've gone and tried to at least look at the different types of roles and what they might be involved in. And as you can see here, um, you know, we've got, um, Nikki Davis came up with a nice tight model, teacher, designer, and facilitator. Uh, Rick Fertig and his colleagues came up with a much more detailed model, although you can see that the instructional designer roughly lines up with the designer, the teacher roughly lines up with the teacher, the facilitator, local key contact, mentor, technology coordinator, guidance counselor roughly line up with facilitator, and then the administrator sort of left out on their own here but you know so there's some degree of consistency between the two but you know there's still a lot of people involved here in you know those two or three percent of the kids uh, that are engaged in this you know there's a lot of people that are involved in their educational experience and we don't know much about you know what it means to be effective for any of these particular roles um, we're starting to see some research specifically around um, what online teaching means in the K-12 environment compared to face-to-face -face teaching. But again, it tends to be isolated case studies. Uh, the most systematic research we've seen has probably been around this facilitator mentor role. And the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute have really been the ones that have been driving um, that work. Uh, but even then, most of that work has been based upon a single state, Michigan which is a state that has a graduation requirement. And if you remember, had as many full-time students as what California had, even though, you know, the difference in population between California and Michigan must be significant. I should know I've lived in both, or worked in both states, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but significant, I think, works. Um, you know, so when you look at this, you know, from a field's perspective, you know, really, we are having real difficulty because we've had these these media comparison studies that have dominated the field and in certain aspects of the field still do uh, make up a significant amount of the research that we've seen. But because of the way in which the student populations have been, they haven't really told us that much. They've told us that good students do well in online environments, not as well as we think they should, but they still do well in them. Full-time environments tend not to serve students well, but that might have as much to do with the fact that anywhere from two-thirds to 75% of full-time students attend a full-time school that's run by a for-profit corporation. So how much of it is actually, you know, the type of instruction that's being delivered compared to the fact that you've got corporations that view students as widgets 
and make decisions and you know based upon the bottom line and not based upon instruction uh, instructional design or pedagogy um, you know once we get past a lot of that comparative research um, in many cases we've got these you know single case study type things where we're looking at less than two dozen students um, at a single school or in a single program you know so and the thing that I think is probably the 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 we're as researchers in the field, we've shot ourselves in the foot the most, is that we haven't recognized for the most part the limiting nature of our studies. And I say we because I'm as bad as this as, as anybody. You know, I did a study back in the late not so the late you know, 05 to 06 kind of 07 kind of range, where I interviewed maybe I think it was eight to 10 designers that were designing courses for K-12 students. And it was based on a single program back in, in Newfoundland, Canada. And the particular program I was looking at uh, was mainly, uh, the instructional model was mainly a synchronous model. So they didn't use the online, the online asynchronous content that much anyway. The title of my article was Principles of Effective Course Design for Adolescent Learners. Because, you know, eight to 10, um, you know, interviews with eight to 10 course designers in an isolated program, you know, on an island in the North Atlantic, you know, is all you need to create principles of effective um, instruction, you know, and that's typically what we've seen. The number of times you'll see things like principles or best practices or, um, you know, effective strategies for in the title of something in our field. And then when you look at it, you know, it's a case study that uses, um, you know, a survey or interviews, or if you're, if you're lucky, both with still, you know, a couple of dozen students. Um, you know, now having said that, the, the particular shortcomings that you've got here really do mean that, um, you know, from a field's perspective, we do have a good way forward because we know all the things that we've been doing wrong in the field now, um, you know, and, and there's a fair amount of it. So we've got a clear roadmap in terms of what we could be doing. And, um, you know, one of the, the key things for us is trying to get more people involved. You know, when you only have 25% of the people that are publishing anything in the field that publish more than a single article, um, you know, that's, I think, to tackle a lot of both these issues and the idea of trying to understand you know, the varied interactions that are happening here and how we can do it in effective ways. Uh, I really do think that we need more than, you know, a couple of dozen, three dozen people that are actually actively working in the field. And, and really, that's what we're looking at right now in terms of folks that are actively publishing. Uh, the number is probably around two dozen. Um, you know, so if you're looking, if you've got doctoral students that are looking for something that's going to sustain them, from their dissertation to when they go up for promotion and tenure. There's a lot of stuff in the field of K-12 online learning that is available for them to look at. Um, I haven't had any questions other than the one from James come through in the chat. And I think we're probably, I don't remember if these are 60 or 90 minute ones, Will, but I'm willing to hang out for a bit if folks do have questions. If you do have to pop away, I'll pop that up there now. Feel free to email me if you've got questions that come up later or you just can't stick around uh, for the questions that we're going to have now. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, Will, to moderate whatever might come up here. Okay, thanks. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, thank you for that. A lot of um, stuff that I was new to me. Um, I, I think I have a couple questions, but I'll first I will, I'll open it up to the to the group. Uh, does anyone have have anything? Uh, okay, I guess I'll go. I'll start. Um, this is James, um, and and I wrote a bunch of questions down because it's very interesting to me, um, and 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 I'm probably show my my uneducatedness or ignorance, I guess you could say, in the field uh, as I ask these questions, but. Um, I noticed with the population, the the lower income or minorities, how do we get at, um, a lot of people send their kids to school because they're, they're dual parents working and, and they use that as a babysitter. 
um, with the distance ed, you know, or the, or the K through 12, how do we allow the kid to stay at home and, and do this education? And has there any bit, been any research done on that? Um, well, in terms of how it works, um, basically depend well, first of all the age of the student will make a big difference here obviously the older the student uh, the more this will tend to happen the instructional model in these virtual these full-time virtual schools um, is based upon the fact that there is somebody at home while the student is engaged in their online learning in fact they've even given that individual name it's a learning coach and at least once since they've started using this model, um, the corporations have actually been sued over the use of this person because um, in the corporation's own material, they specifically say the learning coach is the primary instructional support for the student. Um, and what they got sued over was essentially uh, most states require you to have teacher certification if you are primarily responsible for the instruction of a student and most parents or guardians who are the people or older siblings or the people that end up being the learning coach um, don't have a teaching certificate. Uh, most of the states where this has been an issue have gone back and changed the legislation so that it's no longer there. Um, typically speaking, what will happen is as a student, and I'll, I'll use a middle or high school student who's let's say needs less supervision. I would go in and I would log into my course. I will take a multiple choice test that determines what I know and don't know about a particular topic. The AI that's been, the artificial intelligence that's built into the system will then take all of the themes of that topic that I didn't know and start to provide me with multimedia based instruction on the things I didn't know. I'll go through that instruction. In most cases, it's audio and video and and, you know, a few things I might have to point and click, some stuff I've got to read there, that kind of thing. Um, you know, think typical corporate designed online learning. Then at the end of that, I'll take another multiple choice quiz. The second that I hit 80% on any of these quizzes, because that's what they consider mastery, I move on to the next topic. If I don't hit 80%, the AI will go in and give me a different list of an instruction in there. Um, the only time I will interact with a teacher, some of the district-based Full-time programs will require these once weekly, once bi-weekly um, sessions where you log in. Um, and they're usually there'll be two or three of them. You just have to pick one where you'll log in for a half hour, an hour, interact with the teacher. But most of the time, that's just a question and answer kind of period. Um, beyond that, the only time I, you know, particularly with these, you know, statewide ones that the corporations run, the only time I'm going to interact with the teacher is if I decide to reach out to the teacher myself and say, look, I'm having problems, or look, I've got a question about something. Um, in most cases, the only time a teacher will reach out to a student is again, the AI in the system will determine that I've taken a quiz on this topic four times or three times or whatever they've set the magic number to be six times, um, and I still haven't passed it. You might want to reach out to that student because they're struggling. Most of them have it set up where if you haven't logged in for a certain period of time, or you haven't logged in for a duration of time over a period of time. So I haven't logged in for at least 10 hours over a five day period or something. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but they'll set their own metrics. Um, in those cases, as a teacher, I'll get an alert and then I'll reach out to the student, usually first by email. And if I don't get a response from them by email, then I'll usually call um, the student or in most cases actually call the learning coach to find out what's going on. But that's, you know, that's the, the environment that you have. In fact, if you take a look at the um, NEPC report, and I'll, the URL is there, but I'll just grab it and put it into the, um, into the chat here in a second. But um, in my section, of it, which is the research section, I've got a full subsection where I go through looking at the literature and describing essentially what full-time online learning looks like based upon what we've seen in the literature. So it's sort of a a more detailed literature based version of what I just told you. Right. I was just looking at, if you look at the, the slide with the statistics though, the, the, the people that are going to these K through 12 classrooms are, are higher income, um, Caucasian, uh, people that can have a parent sitting at home with them, um, rather than having a lower income where both parents have to work. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, this is the slide I think you're talking about here. 
So, you know, in these cases, yes, I mean, they are getting a, you know, a higher class of student, to be honest with you. You know, having a almost 10% difference in free and reduced lunch, you know, regardless of, of whether or not you've got one parent working or two parent working, you know, you take a look at the differences between uh, just a kindergarten student that would come from a free and reduced lunch context compared to one who doesn't. You know, the things like the number of words they, they know going into or that have been exposed to going into uh, kindergarten, the number of books that they've read going into kindergarten, and then start, you know, exponentially looking at what impact that has by the time they're in grade three, the time they're in grade six, the time they're in grade nine. You know, think about the type of online, the type of corporate based online learning that you've seen. And we've all seen, you know, some of this stuff. Any of us who've done a MOOC over the last years, if it's come from a university that has its own shop doing things, likely speaking, it's been more corporatized than, than most. Um, you know, think about what that would mean if you were an ELL learner compared to a not ELL learner. And when you look at, you know, enrolling less than half a percent of ELL students compared to, you know, 14% in the states that this program operated in, 10% nationally. You know, that's a big, death. you know, just the national average, you're looking at a difference of 19 times different, you know, 19 times less, um, you know, ELL students. So not just in terms of, you know, the parents being home, but even the parents having the ability to help their students. Um, you know, and and the type of, of kid that you've got in these environments. Anyone else have any uh, any questions, comments? I, I have Thank one for you. I, I'm wondering if you uh, do you have a sense of. Uh, uh, you were talking about some states require at least one online class for students. What's the driver uh, policy-wise for that? Um, when we've seen it debated at the in the state legislature, it has oftentimes been around this notion that you know. <clears throat> excuse me, for the rest of their lives, students will have to learn in these largely independent online environments, regardless if it's when they go off to some form of post-secondary or a lot of the, you know, workplace training that, that's happening now. You know, I, I spent six years at uh, Wayne State University in Detroit, and I look at, you know, the type of training that's provided by the auto sector for a lot of these, you know, blue-collar workers. You know, a lot of that is done in, in these online or web-based settings now. Um, so even if it's not, you know, done by themselves sitting at home in front of a computer, they bring them all into, you know, a, a training center and everyone sits in front of their own computer and goes through and clicks through. Um, so the logic behind it has always been that idea of, you know, this is how students are going to have to learn for the rest of their lives. So we might as well give them the skills and teach them how to do it now, which, you know, sounds great from a rhetorical kind of perspective or rhetoric kind of perspective. Uh, the problem is that, is that there's no research out there to support that. In fact, there's only been a single study that's actually looked at the impact of students who have studied at a distance in high school in terms of their ability to study online in university. Um, it was a study that Dale uh, Kirby and Dennis Sharp did back at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Um, I also co-authored the paper with them just because they were lazy and didn't want to do an original lit review. So they just asked me to come in and do the lit review and discussion part because, well, as you can see, I'm sort of got my pulse on the, my finger on the pulse of the field. So I can knock out a 500 word lit review pretty quick. Um, but they were the ones who actually did the study. Um, but they basically found that the folks, the kids that had an online learning experience in high school weren't as effective as online learners in the university environment. There was lower retention rate, and they also had a lower self-efficacy around uh, independent learning than what the kids that didn't have that experience. So it found the exact opposite of what the rhetoric of these, um, you know, that we see in these, these legislatures. And um, it's interesting because the Michigan was the first in 06. So, I mean, this is not a new thing. You know, this is something 
that, you know, Michigan has had now for a decade over a decade. Um, and in fact, at one point in time, there were actually upwards of 11 states that had these requirements. Um, some have backed off. Um, in most cases, it's been a single course or some kind of uh, specific coherent online learning experience. But in the case of Idaho, when they actually had their requirement, they required two courses, uh, one of which was completely asynchronous was what they, uh, what the, 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 the regulation said. So, um, and interestingly, Idaho doesn't have any online requirement now. But um, so that's been sort of the logic around it. And, and um, but there's been no research as to whether or not that has been the case. And it's kind of disappointing. But again, it's, I think, due to numbers of researchers in the field. Like, excuse me, the uh, requirement would have impacted the class of 2011 in Michigan. So as of June of this year, we've got nine classes worth of graduates from the state of Michigan that have had this online learning requirement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Michigan, Michigan State, Wayne State, and all the other smaller colleges throughout the, the state all have online courses, I'm sure. It'd be very interesting to look at, you know, what's happening in those online courses now, particularly in the first couple of years, um, compared to what was happening before the graduation requirement had, or comparing it to what's happening for students that are coming to those programs from out of state where they don't have a graduation requirement. Mm -hmm. So do you think, so are, are the, uh, are those policies driven by insightful uh, politicians who have their pulse on this field or is it driven by lobbyists who are trying to, <laughs> yeah, okay. you. Uh... <laughs> it, it's, it's driven by money. I mean, you've got, you know, K-12 Inc. Um, and yeah. Connections Education is Division of Pearson. Like, as an example, there was, and it, it's one of the difficult things is because these are for-profit corporations, so much of what they do is proprietary, so it's so difficult to find out information about them. K-12 Inc. a little easier because all they do is provide, you know, online and blended learning. So you can, you know, when they do their corporate filings, that's all they're talking about. Whereas Pearson, I mean, when they do their corporate filings, they're talking about everything under the sun. Because let's face it, Pearson owns a piece of everything in the world, it seems. Um, but I, I remember there was a um, uh, an article that came out in the Financial Times out of London about, I guess, about 18 months ago that talked about how um, in the eyes of investors, at least in the, F, uh, the FT index or whatever the, the London-based index is, um, they felt that if it wasn't for the online schools division in the U.S., which essentially is Connections Education, that uh, Pearson were actually a, a company that you should sell. But because of the uh, online schools division and it was doing so well and it was so profitable, that uh, Pearson was a stock that even though the publishing you know, industry is, is, you know, having trouble that you should still consider buying Pearson because of its online schools division. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I see uh, John wrote a, a question in the, the text there about a correlation between full-time enrollment and religion. Um, not, we haven't seen that kind of, of correlation. Uh, we've seen some of it. There are a couple of um, Christian based online programs in the U.S., uh, Seven Star is actually probably one of the largest. They're based in Ohio, but they operate in, in multiple states. Um, oftentimes, the full-time online programs are still public schools. Um, you know, they still, because they, most of them are formed as charter schools or as a specialized district school. So they're still within that public school realm. The students are still, you know, the funding still comes from the FTEs that every other student in the state gets. And what we find is there are certain populations of students, you know, the evangelicals you mentioned, a lot of the homeschooling parents. One of the reasons why they've, you know, gotten out of the traditional face-to-face -face brick and mortar system is because it's a public school and they don't want their kids in a public school. And, you know, so to enroll them in, you know, the Michigan Virtual Academy or the North Carolina Connections Academy, they're still enrolling them in a public school. And, you know, there's just that philosophical mismatch that's happening there. So uh, we don't see as many people uh, from those types of backgrounds as you would expect 
in, in the field. And, and um, it's something actually that I, I've only really come to learn in probably the last eight or nine years, how the level of mistrust is not the, the word, but the, the, the level of angst that many of these parents feel towards the public school system. And even though this is not public schooling like you'd normally see, they still see it as public schooling. And because of that, they see it as bad or evil or demonic or, you know, pick whichever adjective you'd like to use here. Any other uh, questions, comments? So this, so this is James again. Um, I'll probably shoot you an email. Uh, I have tons of questions. Uh, okay, sure. I, I'm really interested in this just because uh, my daughter and the way the public schools use um, a lot of online stuff that uh, I don't feel that's being uh, incorporated in, in these findings, I guess you could say. Um, I mean, my daughter takes or her teacher talks to her online and does all this stuff online. Um, but I, I don't know how you would incorporate that into your findings. So yeah, I think what what your daughter's probably experiencing would be what goes into that black hole blended right. learning that we were talking about. And and in all honesty, there we see really dramatic deal. I mean, like when I start looking at some of, you know, these types of examples in terms of the poor performance, you know, there's exceptions out there. And I could point to individual programs that I think are feeling great needs or that are bucking this trend, but they are really exceptions. Uh, when we're looking at blended learning, the, you know, this sort of nebulous thing I was talking about earlier, there you're looking at things all across the spectrum, right. you know, from, you know, ones that are being done incredibly well. And in some cases really in the same school, you've got, you know, a teacher in one room that's, you know, doing wonderful things and it's really enhancing the child's learning experience and then the teacher in the room next door is a complete disaster um you know where so and whereas you know at least in the online world what we tend to find is it tends to be a lot of one or a lot of the other it's not this really mismatch of things that we're finding all right anyone else have any i really appreciate your time dr barber and, oh, uh, not a problem. Not a problem at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've got my website up there as well. Everything that I've ever written is linked into my website, um, unfortunately, including your chapter, uh, Will. Um, <laughs> I, I put them all up on my academia.edu page. Now, I do link back to the place where you can buy it. So if you like my chapter, you should go buy the book because it gives you the other 50-odd that are in there. Um, but Yeah, it's a big book. As I think everyone knows it's a... It's a, <laughs> it's a bit of a beast. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so feel free to shoot me an email or if, uh, um, and I'll send you these slides uh, probably sometime this evening. Will once I fix the uh, missing Colorado one that I got wrong. Okay. It, it may take me a, a little while to get this video up, but uh, I will get it up on the site. And um, so, uh, you know, again, thank you so much. Um, Mike, Michael, for your time. We, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else does too. And uh, this was great. I'm glad to see everyone tonight. Thanks very much for stopping by. I will, um, there are some upcoming uh, sessions as well. I think June 4th, we have one. And then in July, we have another one lined up and more on the way. So Thanks again, everyone, for being here. And again, Dr. Barber, thank you very much. That was that was really great. Oh, not a problem. Thanks to everyone for the, the questions and, uh, and commentary. And uh, I look forward to attending some more of these now. Okay. All right, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Take good care. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night and good afternoon. <laughs>